Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unsealed. The soul perceives through the portholes, the windows, the orifices, which are the senses. A person who is blind and dumb is isolated. But we can also be spiritually isolated and sealed within our own self and not realise it. The person who is in a mode of total incapacity to stop talking is in that situation, though he may not realise it. Over talking is an illness. The soul cannot receive because the mind is engaged with producing. The mind is not passive. What happens in a conversation on a telephone when we're in a busy place and we cannot actually hear the person who is talking at the other end, but that person can hear us. There's only one way out, it's to talk, but it's a one-way communication. We may think there's communication, but we're in complete illusion, and so it is in life. If we talk a lot, that is our situation. But then, in the Gospel, there is healing. There is healing both with regard to reception and regard to emission. If we are healed in our hearing, we are also potentially healed in our delivery because the person who cannot hear cannot reproduce sounds properly. They have a slurred speech. And we cannot understand them when they speak. That can be healed miraculously or with the help of modern science in some cases. But spiritually it's a different kettle of fish. I'd like to look at a second or two of this problem which actually concerns us more than we think. How many of us actually are aware of the importance of not being heavyweights. Not, for instance, if we're engaged in teaching, preaching, sharing, counselling, are aware that actually we can be tiring for other people. It is a joy to listen to a person who is interesting, not boring, pleasant to hear, and in no way making us feel that we're performing an act of mercy by giving him our attention. One sees the thing. After a while, a person who is not successful in that doesn't actually anymore communicate. The mind of the listener goes elsewhere. The person, on the other hand, who is able, with the unexpected, the variation, the interesting, to maintain without effort his listeners in poise, is a great blessing. But there is also another question, and it's something which unfortunately one is aware of in certain situations. It's the problem of clarity of diction. I have heard from several sources that quite often people are straining to understand what is being said. The accent is not familiar to them and the words are not being heard. They cannot distinguish the actual phrases. They have to pick up from the words that they can understand what the possible meaning and the thrust of the sentence is, but it's their own work then, they're joining the dots. And if one multiplies that by a whole area of several 
for instance, Sunday sermons in a place here and there which are not really enjoyed, what's going to happen? The natural desire to be there will go away. I have heard, unfortunately, of situations where people drift not just to another church in the Catholic sphere, but to another community altogether, because there the preaching is more interesting, more nourishing. This matters because we are falling back very easily on the sacramental system and on the obligation. People no longer just do what they're told. Therefore, we need to be aware that we are competing not only with the media, who are able certainly to attract attention and maintain it, but also with other preachers and teachers in other ecclesiastical communities which actually are able to do it perhaps better than we do, partly because that's all they do. Therefore, it's important. But not only with regard to the preacher, the whole thrust of the first part of our liturgy, what used to be called the Mass of the Catechumens, the Word, involves also expertise on the part of all involved. It is actually quite surprising how few people are able to read in a way which is inviting, interesting and drawing. People suffer the first readings, hoping that the Gospel will at least be well read. The psalm today is the first of the Hallelujah Psalms. Hallelujah at the beginning and at the end. It's 145. It refers, of course, that's why it's chosen, to this question of giving light to the eyes and making us speak if we're dumb. But it's also a reminder that the importance of praise is there and the psalm should not be whizzed through as just another reading. Hallel means praise. It's an invitation to praise the Lord. That's not a reading, that's a hymn. And the Psalter is the hymn book of the Hebrews. And actually, the only real added bit that we have with regard to the institution of the Holy Eucharist itself is the fact that they sang a hymn. Having sung a hymn, they went out. Well, it would have been at the Grand Hallel. They would have been very beautiful, I'm sure, this group with the Lord in the upper room. In the East, they can't imagine a celebration of the sacred mysteries which is not sung. The celebratory mode demands an effort. And one great blessing of the renewal since the Second Vatican Council is that the hard and fast separation between low mass and high mass has been made more blur in such a way that one can always sing some of it. I noticed in France how spontaneously that would happen. One bursts into song because one is happy to be with the Lord and his angels. It's spontaneous. But there is a problem when that becomes a stage for an individual or a group. For instance, it is not to be encouraged that there should be a spotlight on an individual when it comes to things which can actually be sung by all. It's not fair when certain main points of singing, such as the hymn at the end, the sessional, be placed in the hand of only one person who might sing something that no one else can sing. That's not the place for the soloist. The soloist can do other quiet parts where the people can have their eyes shut and there nourish their prayer. With regard to this question 
of speech, it applies also to our daily interaction one with another. I mentioned at the beginning the question of being a heavyweight because we are talking at people and we are demanding an audience for a long time. But there is also the question of, in general, asking for the grace to have a speech, a diction, a conversation which is healing, which is not painful to listen to. And that demands avoiding certain things which are painful, such as using pegs. Pegs are those expressions which are put in when one is thinking about what to say next. In French it's n'est-ce pas, in German it's nicht wahr, in English it's you know, and so on. Every country has its own problem. But one can easily detect a person who is comfortable in speech by the fact that he has no pegs. He goes without any you know or hum or ha into the next part already thought out in his mind. And by the way, before one opens one's mouth, it's important to know where one is going. One never starts any sentence without knowing why one has started it, hoping that the sense will follow. One has to prepare in one's mind what one is trying to make, because each point has to be part of a direction. And with regard to preaching itself, this is something I would like to draw attention to just for a moment, because in our specific situation in Wales, it's one of the problems that we have. The Catholic Church has to compete with a huge tradition of very powerful preaching. It was said one time, not that long ago in time, that the art of oratory still exists in the British Isles in two places. One is the House of Lords, not the House of Commons, which is a glorified slanging match, but the House of Lords and the Welsh, the non-conformist Welsh pulpit. And there are historic reasons for maintaining that. And therefore, when it comes to Catholics coming into that situation, they have to be aware that they're competing against something very rich and powerful with which they're going to be compared. We have a situation where, in practice, what might happen is that if somebody has to preach in Catholic Mars, that person might give an English sermon written in English to somebody to translate into Welsh and then read the Welsh translation. That does not compare with the Welsh oratory, which actually would never spend its time looking at paper, but into the eyes of all present and communicating with every fibre of one's being. That attracts and engages attention. A red sermon does not in the same way. Preaching is not reading. Preaching is not lecturing. Preaching is communicating with every part of one's being and especially the heart. People know when they're hearing something which is believed. Conviction. But also the capacity to convict. And that demands not just giving people a feel-good factor, but making them uncomfortable, and perhaps getting into hot water for doing so. If that's not happening, are we doing our duty? Therefore, this question of the word and its power is not indifferent. I'd like to conclude with just one point. It is not necessarily better to be long. What has to happen is that at the end of every communication, there has been an increase in knowledge. A point. One point, but it has to be made, and too many points obfuscate the one.
the mind cannot take in too many.